Hello, it's another episode of Fiber Grinding's podcast, and uh, today our guest is uh, Daniel Kelm, uh, bookbinder and book designer, and the chemist uh, from uh, Massachusetts, United States. Uh, uh, hello, Daniel. Hello. Very nice to be here with you, Stepan and Pavel. So now, I changed the studio a lot over the years. I've uh, had uh, quite a number of studios, and... Uh, I've been in this building, this old factory building for oh, over 35 years now. So mm -hmm. um, it's just a nice, as I've described it, it's just a really nice community. Here we go. Okay, so I'm gonna just pan around now a little bit and the lights might be a little bright towards the windows, but you can see, um, you know, I've got seven windows in this part of the shop. It's a smaller studio than I used to have. Um, yeah, I've got to turn the computer. So I, I, can see, I see the table of elements there. You see the which? Table of uh, in the elements. Table. Oh, this one, yeah. this one back here? Or which one? Oh, the no, table, no, oh, no, the no, periodic no, table. The yes, yes. Oh, periodic table, I yeah. always, <laughs> I, I, I think that is just a really cool story how that was developed uh, um, over the years. Yeah, so. You've just shown us a, a glass containers. What oh, down those? here on the uh, table here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What okay, we'll those? go, we'll go over there and start uh, looking at stuff there. That's part of a, a project that's called Templum Elementorum, or Sanctuary of the Elements. Right, so let's take a look at these. So um, these are in process right now. It was done as a, uh, an invitation to be in a show at the uh, Smithsonian um, back in 1994. And what I did was I created uh, a artist book and what the whole show was meant to do was to create artist books in response to something from the Dibner collection of science and technology of the at the Museum of American History. So I chose Biringuccio's Pyrotechnia. And you see this cylinder that's down to the lower left there. Uh, that's one of my test cylinders. Um, and when you see the picture of the finished piece, again, I'll send a, an image of it. Um, it's meant to represent the alchemical furnace, the Athenor, which had four parts to it. So the cylinder, there's uh, four cylinders, there's tall cylinders and short cylinders. The short cylinders surround the tall cylinder and uh, each contain a book. So this is the air book because the element air in the furnace operates in the hot air rising from the, uh, from the furnace. Oops. So when you open this, you get a pop-up that has the uh, element for air, the symbol for the element for air, and then two columns of text, which open to show the voice of air, the voice of that element. Um, and at my website, I, there's a video of me uh, working with this book and talking about it. So you can uh, get a lot more information there. But so here in the four books, uh, three of them or two of them are short. The earth book and the water book are short. Earth has um, a uh, triangle pointing down. That's element, uh, the symbol for that element. And that metal set into the uh, patina brass cover is uh, lead. And in the water book, it's copper, um, Venus. And, you know, lead is Saturn. So Saturn for Earth and Venus uh, for water. And then for air, it's uh, um, tin, Jupiter. And for fire, it's iron or Mars. So I bring the, um, the myth into uh, the book, you know, how we understand uh, the, the various elements and the carton that or the crate that the books come in here, I'll pan up to 
um, storage area. So you can see there, it says Templum Elementorum. Um, mm -hmm. I, when I started this project for the Smithsonian, it was just, you know, I, they weren't going to buy it, but I wanted to be in the show. I decided to do an edition of 10. And uh, um, I got one done just enough for exhibition, but it wasn't, the text wasn't all, all complete. And then I put it on the shelf and uh, didn't go back to it until uh, probably about maybe seven years ago, six years ago, a book dealer from Portland, Maine, uh, Ian Kahn came into the shop, saw the crates and asked about it. And that show, he, he hadn't even been a, a book dealer during that show, so he didn't know about it. But I described it to him and he sold uh, three copies for me now. But I'm also, I saw them uh, directly myself too, but that allowed me, Ian showing interest and uh, selling some, helping me sell some copies has allowed me to go back and finish the edition now after how many years? Uh, uh, I took it up again, probably after about 25 years of it sitting on the shelf. So uh, that's been a, a really nice thing for me to get back to doing my own work. Um, so that's, I'll send some um, stills of that work so that you can see the final thing. Then, you know, I get into a lot of different uh, type of binding structures. So this is a collaboration with an artist, a couple of artists who uh, do a lot of uh, words. This one artist, a visual artist, does words on windows and uh, transparencies. So she had uh, pages printed with her imagery and these, these were just test pages. So we did some laser cutting of pieces out of it. But this is just, you know, eighth inch uh, acrylic sheet, both text mm -hmm. and imagery. And so it can lay over each other. And as you stack it up, as long as there's light behind it, you get different readings. So I've created a couple of different uh, ways of viewing this. And one is with a uh, light table. So I'm going to move this over to the light table so you can see that. Have you ever discussed uh, making uh, books with uh, acrylic plates uh, with Ben Elbel or? or uh, not with Ben. Um, um, we talk because, a lot. Uh, of I, I should tell you, I should tell you that he may be interested in, in, in something like that. Oh, sure. Yeah, we just we had a great conversation just a couple of days ago, but that didn't come up. So next time I'll uh, ask him about that. Um, okay, so there is, those are rectangular pages on a base. And the base is an LED light panel. So mm -hmm. I think there are 14 or 15 pages with this. And if you start out, you can read individual lines and then you start layering up uh, two or more poems and you start reading between the lines. And then by the time you've got all of them on that panel, it's dark. And it's just kind of an interesting transition uh, with all this layering. And then all of a sudden the whole surface is dark. And uh, so we did that with these large rectangular uh, panels. And then uh, the square ones that I showed are, um, those stand up on edge. Here, we'll go back, we'll go back over here and I'll show you some other models too that I brought out. So if we, uh, if I pull over these, so the artist that I collaborated with, it was all about how to uh, present different information, different material. So these pages, there's a magnetic base and then you can see these tests. So a lot of these cutouts were to put magnets into the edges, um, but I, it needed to stand up on the base. So I had to figure out these little clip pieces uh, that would hold them together because there just wasn't enough friction to hold things uh, well. And we did a video of uh, about the project. I can send you that link too. And, uh, these clips allowed 
the pages to stand up on this, I think it's maybe about a 32 by 32 or maybe a little bit larger inch base. So upwards of a meter square, but not quite. Um, and the pages were actually set up off of that surface. And these clips helped uh, uh, stabilize it. Um, it was kind of a, a house of cards, but uh, it needed to have some stability so that during a gallery show, the thing just wouldn't fall over. Uh, but that having extend outside the grid brought a, a new uh, way of interpreting it, uh, which I thought was really interesting. So, and then there's a third set of pages that are uh, round and they have a hole in them and they hang on a peg on a a uh, light table that hangs on the wall. So there's square, round, and rectangular. And, you know, this was a collaboration of a visual artist and a, uh, a poet. Uh, so I do a lot of that where I just work with uh, people uh, on their own work, you know, on their concept. But uh, they like my work and they want me to um, add my type of uh, interpretation to it. So I'm going to move this around a little bit and I'm going to go on the other side of that bench and show you some other um, things. I mentioned that uh, I started with traditional book binding, so leather binding, gold tooling, that sort of thing. And one of the classes that I teach, it's a six day class is uh, traditional leather binding. So, I, you know, rounded and backed, uh, uh, hand sewn silk and bands. Uh, it's the kind of the English French technique of uh, pasted leather, uh, all covered at, at one time. Um, you know, I, so I do this traditional rounded and back codex structure, and I, I really love it for certain things. But you know, the flexibility, the opening really depends on the, you know, how far the spine can throw out and the drape of the paper. And sometimes it I mean, this is fine and it's pretty kind of traditional, but I wanted something to open really, really easily. So that's where the other stuff comes in. And as I mentioned, that came from box making. So when I was first starting out, I didn't like making boxes. And I figured out finally that I just didn't like making uh, clamshell boxes that much. But <laughs> If the box has an unusual movement or something, that uh, makes it more interesting. So this was for a five book edition of uh, Barry Moser's uh, Frankenstein. Um, Harcourt Bindery was binding the edition. I was doing five copies that Barry and I collaborated on. So this is only a small scale. The, the box actually was much, much taller and wider, but it was this thickness and I, did this little model just to figure out how to integrate the parts. Well, again, this would be much, much taller. So this slip case would be for um, an extra suite of prints. It always went with the deluxe copies of the books that we did around here. And then the box opens up. And again, this would be much taller. This recess would be for the book. And then because there was a sculpture on the cover, uh, there needed to be an open area here so that the uh, sculpture wasn't uh, uh, was protected. And also this had to press against the board edges to keep the board closed. Well, that meant that here, this flap needed the uh, some sort of uh, clasp. And this is where I put the wire, the first place, oops, here. Uh -huh. First place I put the wire was right, right along this flap and then had a, a little loop that would go through it and then a pin. So that's where wire edge binding started when I was making this project and the resolution that I made for this flap led me into wire edge. Uh, but this also taught me a lot. So look at the spine action here. Uh, there are two spines here actually. Uh, one slides into a slot. And if I take that one mm -hmm. out, you can see it better. So there's a slot right there and this slides into that. And without that, because the, the book was going to sit at this level, there needed to be a spine halfway up at this point in order to support the spine of the book. But that meant mm -hmm. that the whole thing was rather floppy. And again, this is small compared to the finished thing. So putting uh, this extra spine piece in 
adds a lot of stability. Stabilizes it, it because there are then two layers of connection there so that it doesn't flop around the way that the other did. But, uh, you know, if this, if this doesn't slide freely, then it jams in there and it can get damaged. So there's always a risk involved with, you know, this is not a traditional structure. The traditional structures are a little bit less risky because they've been around so long. But this one uh, really served the purpose for what I was trying to do with this whole uh, box structure. So that's where wire edge binding came from that. Uh, and I'll show you some early wire edge binding. Well, boxes is something I always like to talk about. And uh, uh, I enjoyed uh, P Peter's, uh, Peter Garrett's uh, uh, class on box making at the American Academy of Bookbinders, uh, book binding five, five years ago. And I was quite amazed by the things he taught us. And, uh, uh, but, uh, I always try to ask uh, uh, guests of our podcast about bo boxes they make and their relationship with boxes because for many bookbinders, boxes are uh, just only these functional objects that uh, protect books. And uh, but, but at the same moment, there are some uh, bookbinders who uh, make different boxes and experiment with their boxes and uh, i am always happy when we get the guests uh, <laughs> who is interested in experimenting with with boxes so well thank you for for this certainly and remember what i said show. about uh what i said about wanting to integrate the binding into the narrative while well, the box can be integrated into the narrative too so the whole thing really needs to uh here, I'll get down here. Maybe I can see. Nope, I can't get into the frame easily. Um, but, uh, you know, when I talk to a client and uh, they ask uh, me to do a project, I will, I will ask them, how do you want the reader? How do you want someone to approach this? Imagine the thing that you're asking me to make is sitting out on a bench and someone approaches it from across the room. And what do you want, what the, what's the experience? What do you want them to see initially? What do you want to see them to see as they approach it farther and you know, closer and closer? And then what's going to invite them? Are we inviting them to touch it? Are we inviting them to um, pick it up, open it, try to figure it out? And that's all built into the structure and the box can do that. The box is uh, where you express that or bring someone into it. Because normally it's not just the book sitting out uh, in uh, artist books there. You know, I always have boxes for mine. So that's the first thing that they see. And it's part of, part of the narrative, part of leading people into the work and how to access the work. And I prefer uh, multiple pathways through my books. And the, um, uh, you know, the wire edge binding helps me do that because you can enter it from many different points. Um, I'm going to... Uh, Put the camera back down. I'll show you some more models. Well, I just wanted to add that uh, a couple of weeks ago we uh, recorded a podcast with a Greek book, book, book binder, Dimitris. Uh, I, I wouldn't try to pronounce his surname once again because I will butcher it uh, as it was before. But we haven't aired this uh, mm -hmm. episode yet. Uh, they will go online a bit later, I guess. And we also discussed. Uh, uh, box making with uh, with Dimitris and he he said similar things that uh, uh, oftentimes uh, uh, box uh, is a continuation of the story or uh, gives a chance to continue the story that is told by the book and by the binding of the book and uh, he, he told us uh, one uh, 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 curious story about a book he was uh, uh, making for a, a designer book binders competition and uh, he was very unhappy with it and ended up not sending it to the competition. And in the end, he, he wanted to make a box for, for this book uh, just to protect it. And he made the ugliest yeah. and simplest book for this uh, book because, because this was the story of, the, of his relationship with uh -huh. this binding. So. so here's a box for a project. And you can't read it, but Rick Moody uh, wrote this. It's called Surplus Value Books. Um, and was published by a friend of his out in California. They did a paperback version, but the fellow who printed the uh, simple version for him uh, convinced him to do some deluxe bindings. So 
the first model that I did of this, see, the story is about a fellow who's been in an insane asylum or has recently been released. And at first I played it as though this were the painted interior of a cell, kind of a corroded painted interior, but instead I made it uh, an industrial door. So this is uh, just gray material and it looks like there's chicken, you know, or uh, reinforced glass here looking into a door and then magnet closures that allow the box wow. to open and you see immediately a, you know padded cell surface and a straight jacket and i went to the local fabric store to find the material for this uh, straight jacket uh the woman said i know exactly what you need and she took me right to this stuff and she said that probably sounds kind of strange I told you that I knew exactly what straight jackets were made of. She used to work in a uh, institution okay. and had seen them before. But here, so it's all paste. You open the book, you get these experiences, you have to take things out in layers. You open this up. And the first thing it reveals is a letter, which is from the uh, Hollisswood Ho uh, Hospital. And it's the protagonist's discharge paper. So printed as a, you know, a real discharge paper complete with a coffee stain on it. And then the uh, prescriptions for meds. So we're really fleshing out. That's, mm -hmm. This is what I like boxes for, that you can really flesh out the story with stuff. So there's the discharge letter. And then you open this up and you pull out a galley tray that has uh, galley proofs in it for this book, but they're beautifully printed uh, by Chip Schilling at Indulgence Press in Minneapolis. And it's on uh, cave paper from Minneapolis, just gorgeous uh, boiled flax paper, but it's treated as a galley proof for this catalog, uh, surplus value books. And uh, he talked about MAO inhibitors. That's the name of his press. That's the main character. So MAO press stamped or MAO pressed on the uh, uh, galley tray. And then the galley sheets for this whole book with whiteout, with comments, which he would have done for the uh, uh, regular edition in order to for the printer to change text. Mm -hmm. And what Chip did was he went through and he uh, scraped off all of the whiteout wherever uh, Rick Moody had whited something out and reproduced the writing, did it in photopolymer plates, printed it, and then rewhited the uh, the comments out so that uh, it made it look like the original. Wow. <laughs> and because this is a book- That's, that's an impressive a, work. <laughs> you know, and the box really allowed me to flesh it out and there's more layers. Um, so it's a bookseller's catalog and our main character is uh, describing the books and interspersed in the descriptions of the catalogs are his uh, telling of a story about uh, this uh, woman that he loves. And whenever he yells to her that he loves her, she runs away. Well, he doesn't know, she doesn't know him at all. He's confabulating. It's bringing that into the descriptions. It's, they're becoming longer and longer. And finally, uh, the last book is priced at $100,000. So he just kind of goes off of the wall uh, towards the end. And then the colophon is here. And in the colophon, each of the 26 lettered, uh, each of the lettered copies plus two artist proofs have in the box, a uh, baseball card and a Star Wars um, action figure. And it talks about the, um, uh, the condition. This is all about obsessiveness of collecting. Every bit of this is about obsession. So here you remove the discharge planning uh, risk assessment screen, which literally is a screen to get to the other parts of the uh, materials in the box, which include the uh, original paperback. Well, actually it doesn't. And there's a card here, there's a spacer, but it says complete your collection. If you're an, you know, if you're an avid collector, you're gonna to wanna to buy the uh, regular edition and put it where this spacer is. But then what do you do with the spacer? You know, a real collector, it's gonna to wanna to keep the spacer. But we included whiteout and Sharpies 
and things like that. If you want to personalize your copy, add more comments to the book. And if someone did a really good job of it, I think that'd be cool. You know, people ask me, so would you really want someone to mark up your book? And I say, yeah, if it was another artist and really did a good job, I'd, I'd find that really interesting. Um, and then my baseball card, my action figure there. And uh, in the story, he talks about collecting Norman Mailer's, I think it was, it was either Saul Bellow or Norman Mailer's cigar butts in Brooklyn. And he put them in bottles and he labeled the, the intersection where he found them in Brooklyn. And so uh, a friend who had worked here was down Sarah Lawrence and uh, said that one of his professors knew the secretary of this author and we called them and uh, we didn't get their cigar butt. So I had to sit in the window and smoke cigars and then wrap them up like that. But see all of these, and this is where I really fell in love with boxes. All of the box creates a, uh, a way of holding materials that can uh, a com accompany the the text and the imagery and everything. So this the interpretation of the story starts right from the outside of the box and carries through to the interior through all of these different layers. So that's why I really like boxes is that they give me an opportunity to put other stuff and materials in with the book to uh, just help tell the story. Any questions about that before I show you something else? This, uh, not not really a question, but uh, but uh, a commentary, I guess. Uh, uh, this uh, your idea that uh, you would be happy if somebody added to this uh, uh, to this book to this uh, uh, project uh, some of their own notes or something like that reminded me of our talk with uh, uh, Brenda Gallagher. Uh, a designer and uh, a bookbinder from uh, from Colorado, and my fellow student uh, uh, from uh, the American Academy of Bookbinding. She made this project as as far as I remember, it was for uh, open set uh, uh, competition, uh, and she uh, she made a binding for uh, Happy Abstract, a letter from mm -hmm. William Blake uh, to Thomas Butts, and uh, and. Uh, I, I think it was this book. So that there is, uh, uh, there are uh, on on each page or on each uh, 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 there are there is a, a text. Uh, uh, there is a, some I don't know a sentence from this letter or something like that, and uh, uh, sentences go down and down with uh, with each next page. And uh, she added uh, drawings of her own to this uh, uh, book, and uh, she changed it quite a lot. And it was a quite impressive project. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> this reminded me, your 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 story reminded me of our talk. And uh, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, there's uh, you, there's so much you can do. And uh, you'll run into, you yeah. know, if you do, uh, uh, well, if you modify existing books, uh, it does run into a little bit of resistance in some cases, but I think if it's done well, why not? You know, it's especially with commercial books uh, or something that in addition book, there's more than one copy. So you're not destroying or permanently uh, changing the way the world will see that original book. So there are other examples of it. Oh, like that's one of the big differences between book and art world too, that the galleries, the art galleries, uh, if you do a model of something, you know, like I showed you models, I'm always doing models uh, of structures to figure them out. Uh, they'll often price the models higher than the, uh, the addition, if there's an addition, because it's a unique copy, but it's not as, I don't think it's as good a copy if it's done just to figure out, well, I might take that back. It's different. It's different. But, you know, in the book world, that wouldn't be the most valuable example of that book. But it's the most unique, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. That's another question. You know, the art world is just a brutal world financially. Um, I just I keep coming back to the book world because I like the people a lot more. I mean, I, I work with a lot of artists and they, the ones I work with are really nice people. But the gallery system, New York is cutthroat. Or can be. So, yeah. uh, so I come back to book people. I find them to be uh, um, nicer people. Oh, don't, don't, yeah, cut that part out. <laughs> I love all of you in the in the <laughs> art world too. <laughs> uh, but there is a there is a different there's a different uh, 
you know, money comes into it so much stronger <laughs> in the art world than it does in the book world. Uh, so where should we go from know, here? Uh, one more question uh, uh, came sure. to my mind. Uh, could, could, uh, so you say you don't mind if people write in your books. So you don't mind them modifying the books, but what would you think if they modified your binding? Uh, again, if they did a good job, why not? You know, why not? It's because uh, we're all responding to our environment. We're all responding to the world. And that's what our work is about. Uh, and if collaboration and relationship is so important to me, which it is, that would be another way of, uh, of uh, having a relationship. Now, you know, if it's a one-off, I might, in, I, I would prefer if someone asked me, whether that was um, something that I wanted done to a one-off. If it's an edition book, then again, I'm not as concerned because there are examples of what I did uh, in the edition. Uh, but if someone did a good job, say that, you know, some fellow book artist uh, called me up and said, hey, Dan, I'd like to take one of these books that you did and I've got some ideas uh, to modify it, I'd say go for it, you know, if I trusted them, if I trusted their work. I mean, if someone destroys something, whether it's whether I've been asked or not, then that's not so cool. But of, of course, there is a, you know, uh, how many, well, who was it that erased someone's pencil drawing and sold the erased drawing, the square inches of erased mm -hmm. drawing or something? Uh, could have been a, you know, a, well, I can't remember who, but, you know, people modify work. Um, but yeah, so I, if it was well done, I'd find it interesting. I don't see any problem with it. So I, I thought I'd show you just a couple of uh, the simplest form of wire edge binding. Um, in the workshop that I used to do, a two day workshop on wire edge binding, everybody would make a codex the first day and then do this accordion structure the second day and we would do it as the simplest sort of freestanding sculpture a tetrahedron so four panels each of these edges that are shared by two panels have wire in them so the wire has been punched out i don't know how close i can come and have that focus um, mm -hmm. but you know there areas where the wire is exposed and then thread is tied around. And that's what makes that so flexible that it's basically a double axle hinge. So it has full 360 degree uh, rotation. So I've always had those around uh, in the studio since I started doing those workshops years ago. So one day, no, probably in the, uh, must have been late eighties, I came into the shop and I was just playing with some of these structures that I had and I cut holes out of them. And I, this is kind of a level, the type of model that I often make. It's just board that's been taped together so that I can play with form and shape. And I cut these equilateral triangles out. And then I realized that I could wrap it around this cube. And I thought, well, that's kind of cool because I could have text that would be continuous only when the two pieces were together and the text actually could change with different rotations of the cube within that piece. And then I cut some more away on this one and uh, realized that I could take a second tetrahedron and nest it around the whole thing. So you get that. And I ended up doing this, <laughs> this in copper, I called it Venus uh, and it was etched uh, uh, text, mostly for texture, not for reading, because I think I use Chaldean and, uh, oh, some other languages in the, so it was, it was not English meant to be read. I've done others that are in English, but this one was not. Uh, but, you know, when I put that, that together in a class, there's always that moment of ah it's got, oh my God, look at that, people make a noise. That's what I love about these simple structures is that they're interactive in the way that, uh, you, you don't expect a book to be, but if we go back to this structure, that's an accordion book. If we accept that as a book, surface, hinging, uh, uh, you know, movement, compact form, open form, then this has a lot of book elements in it. And I do some that have fixed volume as well. Um, so it goes beyond just the two dimensional panels. But, you know, from this, 
I need I need to show this part of our talk to to my father because when he was younger he loved uh, making uh, these uh, 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 figures with oh, paper. Yeah. Origami. So I, I guess she yeah. will she will love yeah. this transform transformation. Origami as well, but also uh, all these uh, uh, stereometric oh, yes. uh, figures. Oh, and there uh, are lots uh, of them. When I uh, when I go to England to Devon, yeah. there's a mathematician there that I've had interesting conversations with, and he said that there's a uh, international organization that of mathematicians looking at a lot of different uh, configurations like that. So this uh, this one's the all black one. So this one's a little hard to see this way, but notice that there are wires different places. Um, this came out of uh, just a one-day workshop or an afternoon workshop that I did at uh, Mills College in Oakland uh, for Julie Chen's class there. And it was years ago. And one of the students had found this structure in, an, uh, in a uh, geometry class and was using it as an artist book structure. Um, and so she made a little model for me, just uh, cut board with uh, tape hinges and what's cool about this is that it does have kind of a central spine you know this can rotate around that that can rotate around that but then if you grab the right edges you can open it up into different shapes and so it's you know it's actually a very simple structure it's you know, a cube is six sided, each of the sides, instead of a face has one of these four um, piece uh, units. And those are all joined at what would be the edge of a cube. And so it's 24 panels, all identical. And when you put them together, they integrate in a way that allows them to move. So there's the compact form. And then it has a couple of uh, you know, open forms that culminates in that, but also does uh, this, which is kind of cool too. So it brings the, you know, the the hexagon comes into it that way. But yeah. so I like these sorts of structures, which almost always come out of toys. And when I travel around, uh, my friends in different areas will bring out a toy and give it to me and say, Dan, here's another binding for you. Um, so, uh, you know, that just, uh, that just plays into my work looking at, uh, uh, existing structure, you know, talking about traditional stuff, but then also looking at, uh, interactive forms that could be brought into my book arts. And that's where I really find, uh, my artist books have gone. And I mentioned earlier that a transition for me was making books that had covers, and covers with sculpture on them, and then making these other structures that there's no differentiation between cover and text page. So the whole thing can integrate in a way that uh, uh, that's different. It's just different. It's not not better or worse, but just different than traditional books. And this all somehow also reminds uh, reminds of alchemy, mm -hmm. this sort of permutation of books. The, the sort of what of books? permutation yeah. or I, I i i yeah i'm not sure how to pronounce it in, in yeah, no, no. i mean <laughs> yes. the transformation and interpretation of, of uh, yeah. books well yeah. yeah it's fluid i think it should be fluid uh, so many people think of books as static and they're not static at all um so you know i like digital books but i uh and hypertext has always interested me uh which came out of digital books but there's just something about a physical book i don't i don't read digital books uh i just like picking up the uh the physical object it just feels more personal to me and more satisfying fine and certainly I write about it being relevant to mathematics. I mm. know a few people who devoted their, uh, their scientific life uh, to studying those kind of shape. Uh, it's also relevant to modern architecture, foldable, mm -hmm. uh, uh, flexible architecture. Uh, uh, I've, uh, I've heard of a, a Japanese mathematician currently working in England who's built, uh, who's developing mathematical theories around those very types of construction mm -hmm. to, 
uh, to build foldable molecular machines. Yeah. So it's the so you are in a way at the forefront of uh, of both art and science. <laughs> well, this was really exciting to see. Yeah, I uh, you know after I studied chemistry and then studied alchemy, I was starting to get pigeonholed as a 14th, 15th century alchemist, and people gave me uh, pointy hats, sorcerer's hats, and it wasn't quite the way that I wanted to uh, approach it. So what I do is. I look back and I, you know, take the parts of alchemy that I thought were uh, part of the world today that we could use today. You know, I talked about uh, uh, Descartes and the Cogito, uh, Francis Bacon, you know, his part of his philosophy, which was right at the heart of science, talks about how we're at war with nature, we need to uh, conquer and subdue nature. Well, how well has that worked for us? So disconnect through objectification from Descartes and then uh, conquer and be at war with the environment around us. So I responded to that by studying alchemy. And then when I got pigeonholed in alchemy in a way that I didn't really see my work uh, expressing, I um, coined a new phrase, uh, poetic science. So my work is all about poetic science and I'm writing the uh, manifesto for poetic science, which will lay out the uh, philosophy of poetic science. And uh, in it, as I've said, you know, I like the subjective interpretation of the environment that the alchemists use. Well, that's part of it. I think uh, I look at some of my books as instruments of poetic science and for me, an instrument of poetic science is one that can't be used by a single person. At least two people have to be involved with it. And a great example of that is a, a musical instrument that one of my collaborators in New York, uh, Tauba Auerbach, has done with a friend of hers. It's called the Hourglass. And it's an organ with two keyboards facing each other. It's a pump organ. And when you play, you're pumping uh, the other person's uh, organs. So you can't play it individually. And I just think that's brilliant, you know, that we need to be in relationship. We, we can't just do this stuff. We can't live our lives. Uh, you know, America first never really uh, sat well with me. You know, this is a global community and we need to be out in the world and sharing and, and connecting with people. And that's the only way we're going to survive, I think. So uh, poetic science is, is the way that I bring art and science together and how I think about it and, and uh, um, you know, how I uh, bring it into my work. I infuse that into, into my work. And it's all about connection and uh, uh, just a rich um, experience, a satisfying experience. This, this also reminds me of something you told us earlier uh, about uh, these different uh, uh, book masters and uh, who wanted to keep their secrets mm. to their own and to, you know, to take them uh, to their graves. And uh, this is sort of medieval and feudal uh, approach to arts and mm -hmm. crafts uh, when you don't share your secrets. And luckily, it seems that uh, things are changing. And uh, we discussed this uh, uh, topic uh, several times on our podcast. And uh, there, of course, still are professionals who wouldn't want to share their secrets mm -hmm. and they they prefer the their secrets to be lost when they die uh then they uh, to share it uh, with everybody but uh, it seems that things are changing yeah. bit by bit and uh, people people more people prefer international collaboration and experimentation uh, to to bring their art and their craft uh, forward mm -hmm. So I'm glad to see you as a part of this movement. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, everybody does it differently. So even if we learn the same techniques, we're going to do it differently. You know, and that's just the way it goes. So everybody's got their own way of working, their own expression. So I'm, I'm happy to uh, uh, be out in the world with all of this, you know. And, and that was kind of a response to the way that I was brought up because my dad was very jealous of anything and and uh, kind of contracted in that way. And I can remember when I was renovating the studio one time, he called me up and I uh, told him what I was doing. And he said, yeah, are you training anybody? And I said, yeah, I'm training a bunch of people. And he said, ah, training the competition. And I'm thinking, no, I'm training people that can help me do this work here in my studio. And then if they go off and do more stuff, all the better. 
you know, so I don't, I respond, I responded early on, fortunately, pretty badly to that kind of restricted, um, selfish way of thinking of things. And I think really it helps everybody and it helps ev even yourself if you have an open heart and you go out in the world and uh, embrace things rather than trying to change them. I mean, I change things, I, I invent, but I mean, I'm not trying to control yeah. anything. And in fact, I gave up on, I don't believe in cause and effect either. Uh, that came out of reading David Hume in uh, philosophy and all of the qualifications that you have to put on it to make cause and effect really, really work. Um, I thought, no, it's better to take the uh, indigenous uh, people's uh, way of looking at the environment here in the States and probably everywhere that it's an invitation. You're not trying to force anything. The rain dance wasn't trying to force rain to happen. It was an invitation to make rain, to have rain happen. So I find invitation much more compelling than any sort of compulsion or, or forcing. I don't like it when try, people try to do that to me. And so I don't do that to anybody else or to my materials. It's just not necessary. And it makes it less of an interesting experience. Um, this also reminds me of this person from the audience who, who shouted at yeah. you that this is the book. <laughs> yeah. And uh, if, if you are making, uh, if you are make if you are only making books like they were made, so I, I don't know, 50, 100, 100 years ago, and all of your books are the same and use the same technology. Of course, when you are training someone, you are training competition because mm -hmm. they probably will make all the same similar books. But if you are a creative person and you, you are bringing something new, you are really training mm -hmm. partners or uh, people who help you to oh, do yourself and in, invent more. So it's, yeah. it's just how the creative process works. Well, I have some friends who feel like there's not a big enough pie for everybody to do really well. And I don't agree with that. You know, I think we just bake a bigger pie. People used to say, Dan, you know, you're inventing all these things. You'll paint yourself into a corner. And I said, well, if I paint myself into a corner, I'm going to paint a door on the wall and walk through that, you know, or walk over the wet paint. Who cares? You can paint it again, you know. Uh, so if I, if I'm making something and it's not going well, I just take it apart and start over, you know, it's just, it needs to be, you know, it's not going to be perfect, but it needs to be of a, a certain quality before I want to let it go. And, you know, a successful, uh, expression of what I want to do. So, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of risk involved, but also a lot of possibility. And that's what I focused on is the possibility. And, uh. And openness is, you know, if you haven't, if you're open, see, if I'm open, I can draw energy from my environment. I connect, I ground, I connect to the environment. I gain energy. If I close down because I'm afraid or scared, then there's no way I'm going to be able to draw energy from the environment, from my collaborators, from my partner, anybody else, you know? So closing down shuts down the creative response because fear and uh, um, fear doesn't allow that, doesn't allow openness. You have to be open to be, to, to have or discover the creative response. Fear and, uh, I keep thinking of fear and trembling because of Kierkegaard, but fear just closes that down and shuts you off to the world. And then, then you don't move, you don't gain, and you don't help other people. So open, even though it's risky, I think an open stance is really the way that uh, we all move forward. Well, I hope more people will share will share your ideology. And I do too. I think there, are, you know, like you said, it's changing in our profession. And you know, I live in a part of the states, uh, Western Massachusetts, where it's really a lot of very inclusive people, and uh, uh, people are trying to do a good job, which I really appreciate. And it's not. You know, everyone's trying to help each other. And I just find that inspiring and the way I really want to live my life and the way I hope other people do too. Do, uh, do you also collaborate uh, in a way uh, with your clients? Are you open to their suggestions? Or how, how does that work? Because uh, uh, they yeah. are the ones who are going to use these books. It's very sure. important that part of them is also. Oh, absolutely. Them. And I do that uh, in I, a number of different ways. I mean, I do all sorts of work. Some work is mine alone and I might do all of the work or I might ask other people to help me. Uh, 
uh, physicalize my ideas, but then I also do, uh, uh, I'm subcontractor sometimes, uh, someone will bring a book to me with a real strong idea and ask me if I want to do it. And if I find it interesting, I'll say, sure, but it's not, you know, it's my handwork, but it's their concept. But sometimes that can be really interesting. But then I also do true collaborations where we sit down and there's a give and take and uh, the ideas change over time. And those are really fun. I mean, I love doing my own stuff too, but in collaborations or true collaboration, you never know where it's gonna go because it's you know, input from outside of you. And I find that really important. So if I'm doing a, okay, I guess a subset of that would be uh, what you're asking about collaborating with a client. So a client comes to me with, a, say, a text block and they want a binding put on it, traditional thing, uh, more traditional. Um, I ask them how involved they want to be. You know, if they just, some of them will just say, I know your work, Dan, just do it, uh, have fun. Uh, but I always ask if they want to be involved and tell me a story. Actually, if someone brings an addition to me, uh, I always ask, tell me a story first. I suggest that they tell me a story about what it is. And that could apply to an individual book as well. Uh, Robin Price, when we've done a lot of books together, she's done a, a publisher and uh, printer in Middletown, Connecticut. Uh, one time she came to me and I asked her that question. I said, uh, can you tell me a story about this book? And she hemmed and hawed because she hadn't heard that before second time or the next time she came to me with a project I got half of that sentence out tell me a story and she launched into this great story about uh just her it was the backstory of the book and how she saw it and her what she did in researching it and how she wanted it to go out in the world that gave me lots of information so I could then respond to her saying that and the book ended up being better than either one of us would have made it on our own. So yes, I do. Uh, someone, you know, someone might say, oh no, that's not my thing. You just go ahead and do it. But if they have ideas, I'm very interested in hearing them. Yeah, that's, I guess, we, 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 had, uh, we had guests uh, uh, on our podcast who, uh, to oh, not try who who like to collaborate with their uh, customers it seems that uh, there is more collaboration between you and your customers than uh, most of the book binders will go for or will allow and uh, so it's it's really impressive to see to hear about well and i've also been doing this for you know since 77 so 40 <laughs> almost 45 years at first you know i didn't i didn't think of it in those terms but i've built up my practice uh uh, in a way that allows me to collaborate with people. You know, I don't, I used to do a lot of repairs and that, but I, I really like working with new materials. So whatever I'm doing is usually new materials. So it might be an old text block that gets put into a new binding. But uh, I think, you know, when you're doing repairs or conservation work, then there's a set way of doing it or an agreed upon way of doing it. And so there's less collaboration in how it gets done. But in creating artist books, you know, the anything is possible. So it's really fun to hear people's ideas there. I'm not, I don't take it personally. I don't, uh, I'm not invested in the result as long as it's good, as long as it's interesting, as long as it does what we wanted it to do. And I don't, I don't always hit that, you know, that's a high mark to, uh, a high threshold, you know, and some of the books, there are a couple of books that I put out in the world that I wish I could take back, but not many, not many, but there are a few. Um, so, yeah, so I, you know, I'm, I guess I just like talking to people too, you know, so if my client has some ideas, I love to hear it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, That's great. Yes. I, I've got um, uh, oh, one, oh, one more question uh, for you, and mm -hmm. perhaps we, uh, we could start to wrap it up because it's getting mm -hmm. late in here. Uh, I really wanted to ask you if you've been thinking about your legacy in these mm -hmm. last few years uh, after the scare. I mean, what would you like your legacy to be? How would you like to be remembered? 
Mm -hmm. Uh, I have thought a lot about that, not just because of the uh, COVID over this last year, but getting that cancer diagnosis, you know, I really thought, okay, my time is limited. Now, in a way, it's a gift because it's uh, allowed me, it's given me enough motivation to really think about what my legacy, what I'd like it to be, how I want to finish out my life. Uh, how I want to die, you know, I, I want to have a good death. And, you know, I could have died in a car accident or anything, you know, anybody can, uh, without knowing, but here I've been given this uh, uh, warning that things are going on that could take your life. So I have thought about that. And I've remembered a number of things. Uh, one, when I was about eight years old, and uh, Oh, one of my favorite great aunts, just a wonderful person. I played with her a lot, uh, was on her deathbed. And I went and uh, um, visited her. She was not responsive. But one thing I noticed right away is that she had no flesh on her, on her bones. It, you could see every articulation of joints in her arms and in her shoulders and in her hands. And I found that really interesting. But then I started thinking, what's it like to be on your deathbed? I wonder what she's going through. And I couldn't talk to her, so I couldn't ask her. But then I started thinking, so what's it going to be like when I'm on my deathbed? And it's the, you know, I'm maybe got a few hours, a day, minutes left. What do I want that to be like? And I thought one thing that I didn't want to have happen at that point is I didn't have to have you or have huge regrets about how I lived my life. I thought that would be awful to be on your deathbed and think, oh, God, I wish I had lived my life totally differently. There's nothing you can do about it at that point. So at eight years old, I decided I was going to try to live a good life. I didn't know what that meant at that point, but it just seemed like an important thing. And my guideline was, will I regret that later on? Now, I have done some things that I regret. I've, I've taken a lot of risks, but for the most part, I've lived a good life. And I've shared my experience with other people. I've done a lot of teaching, teaching for 50 years. Um, and that's my legacy. The people that I've touched are my legacy. Now, my books also, you know, my books are in a lot of collections, both private and uh, uh, public collections. And that's part of my legacy too. Uh, but I think more important is the influence that I've had on other people to discover their own artistic voice and develop their own work and do things as well as they possibly can do. So that's the most important, important part of my legacy. But I also like the fact that these books that I've made are going to be able to be seen after I'm gone. So I consider that an important part also. But it's more the personal stuff, the uh, relational stuff that I find is really uh, most important to me. And uh, that I feel like I've done a pretty good job with. So I, I feel, I mean, I, I hope I'm not going to blink out here while we're still doing this podcast, but who knows? You never know when you're going to die. Just, uh, I asked my assistant, Aaron, uh, we were talking uh, about it and because uh, my brother-in-law died from COVID, one of my brother-in-laws, and he had a good death. He decided not to go on a ventilator because of uh, existing conditions. And it was a very brave thing to do. And it made me start thinking more about, about this issue. Uh, but I said to Aaron, I said, you know, uh, we were talking about uh, being on one's deathbed. And she said that she had worked with a lot of uh, elderly people and her supervisor one time she talked with her. Uh, she asked, how can you coach someone to uh, have a good death? And the supervisor thought about it for a while and looked at her and said, you know, it seems to me people die kind of the way that they live. So if you want a good death, you should have a good life. And, uh, and just be aware and open and uh, be here now. You know, it's uh, just be present to whatever's going on around us. And that's why I like making things because I have to stay present to the operation of making something, otherwise it goes badly. So it always, always pulls me back to the present rather than wandering off speculating about something that could or couldn't happen uh, in the future. I think about now. So that's what, uh, that's my legacy really. I mean, it's the books and I do have an archive. I've got, you know, I've done, oh, 200 projects and I've got a box with all the pieces from each of those projects. And originally it was gonna go to Smith College, but the rare book library in there uh, moved. And, you know, more and more rare book libraries are um, 
are changing their collecting. Uh, they're not buying just widely, but they're trying to focus in on what uh, faculty needs for their uh, classes or on, uh, you know, trends change. So the person that's at Smith now, very nice person, but her interests are different than the last uh, librarian. So my archive is not going there now. And I'm trying to figure out what to do with the archive. Because I think for people that want the nuts and bolts of how things are made, if they see one of my books, they could go, if it, the archive is someplace, they could go and take a look at the parts. And actually at Smith, we were talking about for the important projects for me to do a video opening the box, taking the parts out, talking about the project, about how the interaction or the relation between these different pieces, and then sharing anecdotes about the uh, making of the project too. And some of the collaborations there are great anecdotes. Um, so it just adds to the uh, storytelling around the piece. So yeah, I guess those three things, you know, it's the books, it's the uh, bits and pieces left over from the books and the correspondence. And then there's the all the people that are out there that I've taught that are making their own stuff and and uh, taking the whole profession to a, another place because everyone's individual and will do it differently. So the, does that answer your question, Pavel? Uh, Pavel, uh, about... Uh... <laughs> and many times over. Uh, you, you said that your legacy are people you touched and uh, I'm... I'll have to consider myself a small part of your legacy now because talking to you really touched me. You're, uh, uh, thank you. You're, you're really bright, a really, a really nice, really thoughtful per person. I've never met anyone like you. Ah, well, that's very nice of you to say that. Yes, we're all unique, aren't we? <laughs> I'm a little crazy too, you know, but I think uh, artists are all a little crazy, right? <laughs> Um, I, I've spent my life uh, uh, surrounding myself by people uh, that are a little bit crazy. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, I'm a bit afraid of those really normal <laughs> people. Well, who does best when the economy tanks? You know, it's artists because we've never been given that much support from the government. So at least not in this country. So if something tanks, uh, we dance. You know, that's we've learned to dance because we have to shift our... Uh, the way we look at things and the different things that we make and the different markets, if you want to talk about uh, the economy, uh, in order to make a go of it. So I think we're really well versed for shifting economies and shifting uh, fortunes in the world. And yeah, being crazy uh, helps that. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, Daniel, for being with us today. It was really insightful and uh, uh, it was really interesting to hear your story and uh, to see some of the objects you made and uh, uh, many thanks to our viewers and special thanks to our patrons and supporters on Patreon uh, who make uh, editing of these uh, podcast videos possible and cover our expenses. Uh, I'd ask uh, some of you who haven't joined the crowd on Patreon to think about it. Pledges start with only one dollar or, or one euro, depending on where in the world you reside. Uh, we plan a lot of new things uh, to add to, to our podcast this year, including a French-speaking uh, host uh, to talk to French-speaking guests. And uh, if you are ready to support us uh, uh, with your money, please uh, uh, check the link below. Uh, you will see some of the names of our supporters on the screen. And uh, thanks again. Thank you again, Pavel. Thanks, uh, Daniel. I hope to see you once again later this year. Good. Thank you so much, both Stepan and, and Pavel. I really uh, enjoyed this and appreciate uh, that you're taking the time. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye. You too.